Good morning, Jedis and Conway Cougars. Today we're doing chapter six of Small Spaces. The class wandered in or sprinted in just as the bell rang to find a promised donuts nestled in a white box at the front of the room. Mr. Eason knew the value of food bribes, especially on a cold, wet farm day. Ollie took a plain cake donut. She would save her chocolate chip muffin for later. Munching, she stowed her stuff and pulled out small spaces. She read just for a minute. The next day, Caleb came back. He was pale and blue-lipped. His eyes were strange and distant. I remember him thinking with a shiver. I remember thinking with a shiver that a drowned man breathed back to life would look like him. But it was really him. It was his voice, his smile, only the look in his eyes had changed, and he would not say where he had been. I don't remember, he said. The town decided that he must have hit his head and wandered for days insensible. I made myself believe it, too. I have never seen anyone so glad as Kathy was when her two sons came back to her. She cried with joy and didn't even notice the look in Caleb's eyes. The next pages dealt with Beth's wedding and the honeymoon. Ollie began to skim. She wanted to know the end. She wanted to know what had happened with the smiling man. She caught snatches along the way. Caleb was best at the wedding, standing silent at his brother's side. Kathy cried again when we said our vows. She loved her sons very much. We were a month in France after the wedding, and I did not think the Mediterranean was as beautiful as Smoke Hollow was in the spring. The night you were born, it snowed in May. I have never loved anyone as much as I've loved my Jonathan, except for you, my dearest daughter. There was so much joy, so much peace in our house until one night, Ollie began to read properly again. It was autumn. There had been cold rain all day and the mist was rising in the corn. It was just after the harvest and the snakes rustled gray and dead. Jonathan had been out late in the barn, I thought. One of the cows was calving out of season. Jonathan came in wet, his hair plastered down. He didn't smell like the barn, not at all. His eyes were white-rimmed and wild. He came back. Beth, my girl, he said, sank into the chair near the wood stove and buried his face in his hands. The smiling man came back. I said, Mr. Easton's voice broke in, what is the significance of Misty Valley Farm, Ollie? Ollie looked up a little wild out herself. Oh, right. Class must have started and she hadn't noticed. Well, it wasn't the first time. Ollie's shoulders stiffened. She took a bite out of her doughnut and said without missing a beat, Misty Valley Farm is the best example in the state of Vermont of the possibilities achievable in a small scale farming. Giggle swept the room. She was imitating Mr. E Easton in lecture mode. Ollie thought she had heard Mr. Easton sigh. The farm has had tremendous success cultivating corn and wheat along with apple, plum, and pear orchards. Orchards, Allie continued. that They had also run an extensive dairy operation and side businesses and local florals and sugaring. During harvest time, they are one of the biggest employer, employers in the, in the county. Ollie remembered nearly everything she read, a, vi vi a vital talent for any girl who reads novels in class and doesn't pay attention. Having neatly recited the introduction to Misty Valley from its website, Ollie tried to find her place again in the book. Without looking up, she could feel the words trembling on Mr. Easton's tongue. What is that you're reading, Ollie? Now is not the time for novels. Put it away. But sympathy face again. Also, Ollie had answered his question. When Coco Zittner's hand shot in the air, Mr. Easton only said mildly, That is correct, Ollie, and turned to Coco. Ollie wished she hadn't made fun of him. Do you have something to add, Miss Zidner? Coco evidently did. She was half out of her seat, waving her hand. You had to hand it to Coco. Anyone else would have crept into class, head down, hoping the notebook incident had been forgotten. Not Coco Zidner. Um, said Coco, the words trembling out. I just have a question. What about ghosts? A faint murmur of interest ran throughout the room. My mother told me about them, Coco added smugly. Coco's mom was a reporter for the Evansburg Independent. She had come to talk to the class once, casual in her jeans with her thick ash-colored ponytail. She made Mr. Easton go giggly. Can you tell us, please? Mr. Easton looked torn. 
I wouldn't say there are ghosts, he said. Not exactly, but there are certainly some sad episodes in Misty Valley's past. Sad episodes were more interesting than agriculture. Tell us, said Phil Greenblatt. The rest of the class took up the cry. Coco looked proud of herself. Mr. Easton hesitated. He probably liked talking about ghosts too. Well, Misty Valley has been in a farm for a while, said Mr. Easton, given up. Or at least people have been farming that land for a long time. Back in the 1800s, it was called, oh, foggy, smoky, something. I forgot now. It gets foggy after dark because of the humidity off the river. And that's why it's called Misty Valley now. Ollie thought of the smiling man, smiling man coming out of the smoky dark. There were two brothers who worked in the field, said Mr. Easton. They used to go about with the owner's daughter. The girl wasn't even 18 when her father died and she became the owner herself. Both boys were in love with her and there was a lot of talk in Evansburg, folk wondering which brother she would marry. 50 acres isn't anything to sneeze about. Ollie frowned and glanced at her book. She married the older brother in the inn. If his younger brother was jealous, there's no record of it. They all lived on the farm. The married couple had at least one kid, a girl. The girl grew up, got married herself, moved away. All normal, right? There were probably lots of brothers trying to marry the same farm girl in the 19th century, Ollie thought. But she looked at her book again. The whole class shifted in their, sheet, their seats. Long dead romances were not as interesting as ghosts. But one night, the older brother disappeared. Mr. Easton continued, just gone, vanished, no trace. Town rumors said that the younger one had finally done him an out of jealousy. Now the class was more interested. Ollie was listening closely. Soon after that, Mr. Everson went on, the younger brother disappeared. No one ever found traces of either of them. Eventually, the sheriff decided that the younger brother had killed the elder and then been so overcome with remorse that he threw himself into the creek. That was when the rumors of haunting started. Rustling in the corn, voices, footprints without steps. They said the two brothers didn't lie quiet. Now the class was silent. In the pause, Allie could hear the roar of the wind on the school roof. She wished she knew how small spaces ended. The woman herself didn't live long after her husband vanished. Throughout her final illness, she swore that her husband wasn't dead and that he was still on the farm. Of course, they never found him. Legend says that now the woman hunts the farm too, looking for her lost husband and her brother-in-law. Eyeing the silent room, he added, you guys good on that ghost stories? Phil Greenplatt looked at Brian and said, be careful, the lady ghost might decide you're her murdered man. Brian snorted and the strange tension broke. Can you imagine how your mother got a hold of that story? Mr. Easton was saying to Coco, bit of ancient history. I suppose she talked to Linda, we Linda Webster. That's how Linda got the farm, you know. She's the great, however many times great, granddaughter of that poor young woman. Ollie Stiffen. Jonathan Webster? John had said to Beth, this is my brother, Caleb, my mother, Kathy. Beth Webster? Linda Webster? Probably just a coincidence, though. A lot of people there were named Webster. Webster's had owned that farm since the late 19th century, Mr. Easton added. The author just heard of Smoke Hollow and copied the names, thought Ollie. But sharp in her memory was a woman, her pale face makeup smeared, her eyes darting around the sunlight swimming hole saying, I have to. Coco's hand was in the air again. That wasn't the weird thing, Coco said. You didn't tell the bad thing, the other thing. The schoolhouse fire. Oh, yes, right. Okay, said Mr. Easton. He addressed the whole class. The Websters have owned the farm since the late 19th century, but no Websters lived on the farm in the 20th century, except for one, briefly. I was a boy in Evansburg at the time. A man, his name was Garrett Webster, as I recall, moved onto the old property and tried to start a back-to-nature sort of school. Basket making and things. He... It was he who renamed the farm Misty Valley, but one day in late autumn, his schoolhouse caught fire. The whole class looked at each other. It was right after dark, one of those thick, ugly nights. The kids had stayed late to rehearse a play, I think. The ash bucket for the wood stove caught fire, and the fire department decided later that no one made it out alive. 
I think there's a plaque somewhere on the farm with all the names of the kids that died. Garrett Webster moved away after that. Well, of course he did. Devastated. They said he was all he was quite su successful, became a banker or something, but he never came back. No one came back until Linda Webster. But the weird thing, insisted Coco, you didn't say the weird thing. Yes, all right, Coco, said Mr. Evanston, Easton patiently. The weird thing, as Miss Zittner puts it, is this. They never found any bodies. The schoolhouse was burned to rubble, of course, right down to the foundation stones. People came up from Rutland to pick through it, but nothing. No bones or teeth, nothing to bury, just stones and the nails that have held the building together. They did, that didn't make any sense to Ollie, but she burst out. To, to burn bone to ash, that fire had to have burned at 1,400 degrees at least for two hours or more. Ollie had done research about fires in the last year, trying to prove to herself that there had been a way, some possible way. There hadn't been, of course, but she was left with useless, useless knowledge about fires. Mr. Easton looked pleased. Ollie had spent the last year determinedly silent in his class, and here she was sprouting out random facts? You aren't the first one to point that out, Ollie, said Mr. Easton. There must have been a lot of theories. Maybe the fire burned hotter than normal. Leftover heating oil, some compound in the paint, tar. Those men from before, Ollie heard herself saying. The husband and the brother-in-law, they disappeared too. Or maybe the children weren't just there. Where would they have gone, Ollie heard herself say. Isn't that a lot of people to just disappear on a farm? I don't know, said Mr. Easton. That's why they call it an unsolved mystery. The county sheriff questioned Garrett Webster pretty well, of course. A big party searched from the farm. Grounds, thinking perhaps the fire was there to cover up a crime. At this whole, at this, the whole class perked up. They didn't find anything, said Mr. Easton suddenly, brisk, seeing the eager faces. You gang of goals, because there's nothing to find. Five years ago, Linda Webster rebuilt the old farm by the river, got it running. It's been hugely successful. Now, they're go we're, going here, we're going there today, not to dwell on the past, but to learn more about the future of farming in this state. So, can anyone tell me story time was over? Ollie wished the class was over. There was something in all this that she didn't understand. She wanted to keep reading. All right, Conway Cougars and Jedis, that is chapter six of Small Spaces. Tune in tomorrow for chapter seven. Have a great day.